So we can start now. Okay. So, uh, Professor Arvind, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Raghavinder Gadakar, Professor Devendra Singh, and viewers. Good morning to all of you. So before we begin with our formal launch, in order to celebrate International Day for Biodiversity, I would like to quote Professor Edward Wilson. If all ma mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. If insects were to perish, the environment would collapse into chaos. So now may I request Professor Devendra Singh to start with day's proceedings. <clears throat> Uh, today's speaker, Professor Gardkar, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Arvind, Dr. Parthi, Head of the Department of Zoology and Environmental Sciences, faculty members, students, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today we are celebrating the International Day for Biological Diversity. And on this day, we try to create awareness about uh, the importance of biodiversity for human survival. Uh, this day was first of all celebrated on December 29, 1993 to commemorate the coming into force, the Convention of Biological Diversity. Uh, and it, it continued to be celebrated on this day, December 29, every year till 2000 when the date was changed to May 22nd, the day when regulations of the Convention on Biodiversity were adopted by the UN General Assembly. The Department of Zoology and Environmental Sciences has already organized 11 webinars during these COVID times. And it is among the few departments of the university who have got their own uh, YouTube channel all those webinars, they are available on the uh, YouTube, YouTube channel of the department. And uh, we have got a, quite a large viewership for those uh, lectures. Uh, all the days related to biodiversity, related to environment, related to biology, we are celebrating. Uh, for example, on uh, June 5th, next month, we'll be celebrating the World Environment Day as well. So the department has been quite active in celebrating uh, these occasions as well as uh, in organizing various webinars during these hard times. Ours is uh, a department, this is for the information of our new students because, uh, because of uh, the problem that we are facing, the world is facing, we could not have proper interaction with the students. So your department, the department you are studying in has been recognized by all the major agencies of the government of India, like uh, uh, UGC in the form of special assistance program, by DST in the form of FIST, by Department of Biology, uh, Department of Biotechnology in the form of uh, interdisciplinary program in life sciences. So the department has been quite active in this respect. Uh, before we proceed ahead, uh, I will like to announce here that uh, today's function we are dedicating to Mr. Sundarlal Bhoguna, the great environmentalist who breathed his last only yesterday. He created a problem, uh, a, a campaign in the in the country in favor of biodiversity. And whatever we discuss, whatever we do, whatever we are going to discuss today. His just one statement is enough to justify that. He simply said, man cannot continue to exploit the other species indefinitely. So this was his one statement that, uh, uh, that uh, explains everything that we discuss uh, in today's uh, uh, webinar. So before we start the webinar, I'll request uh, Professor Irvin of Ronald Vice Chancellor to deliver his opening remarks. Uh, Professor Arvind, please.
Unmute yourself, please. Yeah, so well, welcome everyone and good morning. My job is not to come between the speaker and the audience, which vice chancellors normally do. But I am taking the opportunity to say three things. Number one, I am very glad that uh, Raghavendra Gadakkar has agreed to speak uh, as the speaker today. I know him for a very, very long time. And therefore, this is the beginning of his involvement with the university, not the end of it. Second thing is that uh, biodiversity, how, what role it plays is the topic. So I'm not going to talk much about that. We are going to launch a program in the university very soon to revive the biodiversity of Punjab. Specifically the, the uh, bird, birds and the uh, water species. So we will launch a program in which we will involve national and international experts. And then we will see how we could revive uh, the ecosystem. And the third thing is that the ecology concepts are extremely important for the university. University is also an ecosystem for teaching and research. And that you already, I think in three weeks, you have seen how we are tweaking the system so that the ecology takes over, the natural processes of teaching and research takes, take over and other processes then automatically go in the background. So one specific thing is the departmental boundaries should become less and less important. So, for example, you had to talk about Gohaguna. So this uh, webinar itself could have been botany zoology together. So I would like many more programs as university programs where departments and people from different disciplines come together. And uh, as part of the university ecosystem uh, and, and, and basically uh, leveraging our diversity of uh, academic disciplines, we can do great things. One last thing is that we are launching an undergraduate program very soon in this admission, which will have a liberal arts stream, which will have a science stream, which will have a languages stream, social sciences stream, and so on. And there will be a lot of uh, back and forth going on. And uh, I have studied Indian universities. We are one of the unique universities which can actually run this program because we can teach subjects all the way from Persian to Punjabi to Sanskrit to zoology to you name it and we have it in the university. So we are a very, very diverse ecosystem. And therefore, today is a very, very appropriate day to say uh, these things. And uh, now I want, don't want to say too much. Again, once again, I thank the speaker for agreeing and for the department and the university for organizing. As usual, I don't have to tell you, uh, Raghavendra is a great speaker. I'm a fan of him in terms of uh, his talks. So let's, I look forward to his talk today. So when we dis were discussing in the department that we should celebrate this uh, International Day for Biological Diversity, uh, we could not think of a better person then Professor Garker to deliver a talk on this issue. And uh, students cannot think of a better topic, an inordinate fondness for insects. Because insects constitute more than two thirds of the total known animal species in the world. And they are a dominant component of almost every ecosystem. The uh, this thing will become more clear if we put on record that about 50%, about 50% of the total biomass is constituted in by insects. And you can uh, just compare it with humans that we all humans, more than 7 billion humans together, we constitute less than 1% of this biomass. And insects constitute more than 50% of that, that is the dominance of the insects. That is why whenever we talk about biodiversity, we have to talk about insects. And uh, today's uh, lecture by Professor Gajkar about fondness for insects. So that is uh, the best we could think of. Uh, we'll have his talk, but 
before that i like to uh, invite the students that the, during the talk if you have some queries you need some clarification you should note it down and uh, you have my whatsapp number you can send it to me and after the talk we'll be having a uh, discussion on the basis of your questions or queries or whatever you want need some clarifications so before we uh, initiate the talk i'll request uh, dr parthi to introduce the speaker to the audience thank you dr. very Parthi, much please. and uh, it's my singular pleasure to introduce professor raghavendra gadkar currently based at center for ecological sciences indian institute of science in bangalore professor gadkar is well known for, for his work on evolution of social behavior in insects one of his significant contribution to the field of evolution of eu sociality is the theory of assured fitness returns which is a significant landmark in this field since the seminal work of w t hamilton in 1964 he is an elected fellow of the indian academy of sciences national academy of sciences and indian national science academy he was the president of indian national science academy from 2014 to 2016 professor gadkar is among very few indian scientists to be elected as a foreign associate of the national academy of sciences united states of america he has won numerous awards for his contributions to science research including cross of the order of merit from germany shanti swarup bhatnagar award from csir that is in biology the world academy of sciences prize He is the founding chairman of the Center for Contemporary Studies, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He is an honorary professor at the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Research, Scientific Research, and Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Kolkata. Uh, he is chairman of Research Council for History of Science, Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi. He was elected as member of the German National Science National Academy of Sciences in July 2012. over the last three decades he has established an active research group that has contributed towards understanding the proximate and ultimate factors of social evolution in wasps professor gadkar is much concerned about the future of evolutionary biology in india and is instrumental in establishing the indian society of evolutionary biologists so given this backdrop it's always fascinating and captivating to listen to him as he elegantly effortlessly creates weaves and articulates scientific narratives into his talks that is absolutely commendable so please join me in welcoming professor raghavendra gadkar for today's talk can i start and can you hear me yes okay very good good morning everybody uh, professor arvind professor singh uh, professor himendra bharti and delighted to be here thank you very much for uh, inviting me and uh, it's a great honor to speak both at your university and on the occasion of the day for international international day for biodiversity it's my pleasure to uh, to be with you and i will try and uh, tell you my own interests and my own adventures in field so let me begin by trying to share my screen uh, Uh, can you see my screen now which has your poster <laughs> yes which you sent me wonderful uh i would like to begin by paying my homage to uh, shri sundarlal bhagra who sadly passed away yesterday his life has been a source of great inspiration for many of us uh, we will remember him for a long time but uh, remembering is not enough we must read him we must listen to what he said and we must try to fulfill his aspirations for nature and for wildlife and for human nature interaction there's a great deal to be learned from his writings and sayings and from his deeds and i think we should keep going back to his words of wisdom and use them to guide us in future i would like to attribute i would like to dedicate this talk in fact to my one of my students uh, this is a picture of dr krishnapa chandrashekara who was my first phd student 
tragically, he succumbed to COVID related complications a few weeks ago. And he was one person who I could say unhesitatingly had an inordinate fondness for insects. And that's the reason why I want to dedicate. But I also want to take this opportunity to tell you how much fun Chandru, we used to call him Chandru affectionately, how much fun Chandru and I had studying insects and insect biodiversity. So it's most appropriate that we begin with this. Uh, I write a fortnightly column called More Fun Than Fun. And the aim, my aim in this column is to take the joy and spirit of science to a very wide audience. This is published every alternate Wednesday in the Wire Science, and it's freely available. Uh, three weeks ago, I wrote an article entitled Chandru's Inordinate Fondness for Insects. So today's lecture will be partly based on this talk. There will be some things in today's talk which are not in the article. There are things in the article which will not find uh, I'll not find time today. So if you are interested, you can access this article at the link below. One of the nice things about these webinars and uh, being uh, permanently available on YouTube is that you can always go back and pick up things like this. So I have put in some more things in my slides, which I may not actually uh, read out or talk to you about, but when you go back, you can actually find. So for example, you can find, uh, find this link. So when we talk about biodiversity, when we talk about inordinate fondness for anything, it is impossible not to remember J.B.S. Haldane. J.B.S. Haldane was 20th century's most remarkable, most colorful scientist, uh, polymath. Uh, his life is wonderful to read. There are two uh, wonderful biographies of him, which I would encourage uh, all of you to read. Uh, the first one was uh, by a man called Ronald Clark. Very recently, Saman Subramanian has written a very nice uh, biography. In fact, the subtitle is The Radical Science and Restless Politics of J.B.S. Haldane. I would strongly urge you to read, uh, read this book. Now, there are many famous quotes of Haldane, which we keep repeating. Some of them apparently he didn't say, but uh, he could have said. Uh, one thing that he did say was, that the universe is not only queerer than we imagine, but queerer than we can imagine. Now, this is a very profound statement. Think about it. Not only that we can imagine, but we not, not only we imagine, but we can actually imagine. And one of these queer things, which really falls into this category of queerer than we can imagine, is the abundance of insects, particularly of beetles. A uh, story goes that Haldane, of course, was a confirmed atheist. So to tease him, is there anything that could be concluded about the creator from the study of creation? Theologists apparently asked him just to tease him. And Haldane's reply was an inordinate fondness for beetles. Saman Subramanian says in his book that no one can find out whether Haldane actually said this, but it sounds very much like him. And indeed, it does sound very much like him. But it's also very true. Uh, in fact, if there was a creator, he or she must have had an inordinate fondness for beetles because there are more kinds of beetles, more species of beetles than all other animals put together. Oh, why on earth should this be true? Is this not something that is queerer than we could possibly have imagined? On our own, we couldn't have said that evolution or creation or whatever would have had an inordinate fondness for beetles. There's no reason why we should think so. That's why it is queerer than we can imagine. Indeed, the diversity of beetles is spectacular, uh, unbelievable. Of course, they are also very colorful. And the diversity of beetles is often celebrated. Here is one picture I found freely available on the internet. And there's another picture from PNAs, which celebrated the diversity of insects uh, last year in, in a special issue. Uh, this inordinate fondness of beetles or insects has of course struck a chord not only among scientists, but also among artists. So here is an artist depiction of this queerer than we can imagine fact. And what you see on this slide are depictions of different groups of animals and there's even one for plant there. And interestingly, they are drawn to scale. So the size of the image is proportional to the number of species of that kind. And you can see, of course, there is this spectacular giant beetle, which is adorning the entire picture saying, I am the biggest, I am the 
most diverse. But it's also very instructive to look at a few other things here. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to compare <coughs> the size of the beetle <coughs> with the size of the mammal which you find on your left hand top corner. So that is all mammals and compare that with the reference to the beetle. Even all plants you can see and uh, you can look at amphibians, you can look at uh, birds, you can look at fish, you can look at snakes and they all pale into insignificance compared to insects here represented by the beetle. So when you are faced with something like this, we cannot help asking, but why? Why should this be true? In fact, the very fact that it is clearer than we can imagine begs the question, why should it, why should it be so? Why this inordinate fondness of beetles? Now, if you go a step beyond beetles and consider all insects together, then Robert May, I will have a lot to say about Robert May in this lecture. Robert May has remarked, to a good approximation, all species are insects. But again, why this inordinate fondness for insects? I can tell you at the outset that we have no clue. We have no idea why this is true. And that is what I find fascinating. So we should become interested in something that is unknown. It is the mystery that attracts us to this. There is a tendency in our education system and therefore in our students to cherish what is known and say, oh, I read this, I understood this, I'm going to put this in my, in my, in my library, in my memory. But you must be much more interested in what is not known because that is the sense of adventure. You should be attracted to what is not known much more than to what is known. What is known, understanding what is known is simply a tool to try and understand what is not known. But the real goal should be to understand what is not known. And that is what should attract, attract you, anything that is un unknown. And you can see this in real life. We do this all the time. If you already know who was the murderer, you wouldn't be that interested in reading a mystery novel. But the, purpose, the reason why you read that is because you want to find out who did it. That, that's, that's the thing. same kind of curiosity we should also apply to science. Now, before we can even attempt to answer this question of why so many insects, so many beetles, we need reliable estimates of the numbers of species of different kinds of animals, plants, because we have to begin somewhere. If we know this, then we can hope to build a way in which we can answer the bigger question of why this inordinate fondness. Now, curiously, it turns out that the answer to this question is also not easy. The answer to this, it turns out, is no trivial matter. What, I, what tickles me most is that we have as much uncertainty of how many species we have recorded compared to how, as how many species are out there not to be recorded. This is a very strange fact. You wonder how is this possible? At least what we know we should know and what we need to know maybe there is some uncertainty. It turns out that there is no good estimate of how many species have been recorded. And the reasons for this are very interesting. People have been recording biological species, giving them names, maybe with some description for hundreds of years. And these have been published in different continents at different times, in different journals, in different languages. And we simply have not been able to put that together. Add to that, there's a very interesting problem. Two different people may describe two different, the same species and give it two different names because they didn't know that the other person has already done this. And how do you then remove all of these synonyms and get the unique one? It's a major exercise, believe me. And we are nowhere near completing that exercise. We have a very, approximate estimate of how many species we know. It's a strange thing, but it is true. But to understand the reasons why that is true is very interesting. Of course, how many are there out there? There's also great uncertainty. And we have to, again, do some guesswork in all of this. Now, many people have made it their business, their profession, their passion to try and estimate the number of species of living organisms that the Earth hosts. This is a famous uh, paradox, famous problem, and many people have been interested in this. Today, I want to talk about one person who really has uh, contributed enormously to this exercise. And this is Professor Lord Robert May, uh, the man who is standing in the center of this picture. Uh, I had the great pleasure of meeting him on one occasion when he came to India. 
And this is a picture taken when I actually took him to the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research in Bangalore. And this is a picture taken. Let me introduce you to the people in this photograph. On the left is Professor V. Krishnan of the Nehru Center, who was head of their educational program. Then, of course, we have Robert May. This is the late Professor M. K. Chandrasekharan, who was head of the Animal Behavior uh, Unit in uh, JNCSR. And this is my friend Amitabh Joshi, who is India's arguably most famous evolutionary biologist currently working. Now, Robert May was a physicist. So one might think that this messy task of compiling the literature, finding out how many species we know and how many species there might be in the soil and various places, one might think that this messy task could not have interested a distinguished physicist turned theoretical ecologist and no less president of the Royal Society, Lord May. But it turns out that May thought otherwise. The numbers of species, both documented and undocumented, that May provided to us in an essay entitled, appropriately for a physicist, The Dimensions of Life on Earth, remain till today the best estimates but more importantly, the best argued estimates. And I want to emphasize this word argued because I already said, we don't know how many species we know. We don't know how many species we don't know. And you must come up with an estimate based on arguments. And that is what is very exciting. If somebody told me, I know it is written somewhere there, go to that link, you, it'll tell you how many species there are. Go to this link, it'll tell you how many species there should be. Not interesting. I won't even go to those links. So it's there. If I want it, I'll get it. The fact that we don't know and the fact that we have to estimate and the fact that we have to make arguments to estimate is what attracts me as a scientist. And that is why, why there is thrill in science. Now, Robert May actually published several papers about this topic. He published a paper in Nature called How Many Species There Are, a paper in uh, Science, How Many Species Are There on Earth, and a paper in Philosophical Transactions, How Many Species. And he made very arguments. But today I want to talk about, I want to quote from another article he wrote in this book called Nature and Human Society, The Quest for a Sustainable World, which was edited by Peter Raven and others uh, as part of the US National Academy of Sciences. This is a very famous book. It has very, very interesting, many, many essays. And I, this is freely available on the internet. I'd like you to look at this. I have put here pictures of some of the major contributors. Not all, some of the major contributors to this volume. Peter Raven, of course, who is the director of the Missouri Botanical Garden, who edited this, was the lead editor of this volume. Then we have Robert May, and we have E.O. Wilson, who Himendra Bharti quoted at the beginning of this session. Dan Jansen, many of you know. If not, you should know. Dan Jansen is a kind of legend in conservation of biodiversity. And David Suzuki, there is a whole thing called David Suzuki Foundation, which works for this event. And Thomas Lovejoy, again, is a very interesting person. I'm giving these names because students who have not heard these names will, I hope, be tickled by curiosity to go and find out who is this David Suzuki? What did he do? Why does Professor Gadakar put his uh, photo on, uh, on, on the occasion of the International Biodiversity Day? So I'm, I'm throwing things for students to go and find out. And these days, luckily, because of the internet, you can really go and find out these things. You can't, no longer can say, I, my library is not good, I don't have that book. The book I wanted was borrowed by somebody, or somebody had torn off the page that I'm looking for. All these excuses have disappeared. So we can really go and find what we want. So before I go into the argument, let me briefly summarize what Robert May presented as his final analysis. That's on this table. Robert May, The Dimension of Life on Earth. What we have is different groups, protozoa, algae, plants, fungi, animals, etc. And then you have number of species known and number of species expected. These are the three columns. I don't want you to read all of these numbers. The important thing is that there are these three columns. Now, what I want you to pay attention is, first of all, the total. So, the estimate of how many species we think we know is about 1.5 million. And how many are expected here Robert May's estimate is 6.8 million. But he adds very clearly that this has, uh, may have a lot of error in it, and the number may actually be up to 15 million. So there may be up to 15 million species of Earth, but certainly at least 6.8 million. 
The other thing I want you to know is this row for arthropods. Out of 1.5 lakh described, 855 arthropods, so biased. Out of 6.8 million expected, 4.6 million are arthropods. Insects, out of 1.5 million described, 720,000 are insects have been described. Out of 6.8 million expected, at least 4 million of them are insects. And this reverberates the question, why should this, should this be so? So there is clear evidence that there is this inordinate fondness, if you like, and we must try and understand why. I also want to remember, uh, so now I want to very briefly, very superficially, because I don't have that much time, to give you a flavor of what kind of arguments people might, you might wonder, okay, how many species are known, maybe painstakingly go to all the libraries, get all the journals, talk to all the taxonomies, talk to all the experts, and try to come up with a compilation. How many species of beetles did you describe? How many did I describe? How many did somebody else describe? This is, we have some way of imagining how we might come up with the second column. But the third column, how do we estimate? How do I sit here and guess how many species of worms are there in the soils of different parts of the world? How can we even, so I want to give you a flavor of some of the arguments that people use to come up with this third column. It's not exhaustive, it's not deep, but just to give you a flavor. And in that connection, I think the person who probably made the most significant contribution, who made a paradigm shift in our method of estimating is a man called Terry Erwin. And I want to pay homage to him. Terry Erwin was a very distinguished entomologist at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. I had the great pleasure of meeting him uh, once when I went to visit the Smithsonian. And uh, unfortunately, he passed away last exactly about a year ago, May in 2020, he passed away. And he is a passionate beetle uh, collector, beetle maniac, beetle scientist, coleopterist. And he, as I said, brought about a paradigm shift. So he said, let us see if we can find some objective way of estimating how many species of beetles are there, therefore how many species of insects and therefore the species. So what he did was he, in the tropical rainforest, he covered a, a single tree with some kind of a net and he sprayed a fogging insecticide into that to kill all the insects on that tree and bring them down onto uh, pieces of cloth that he had put on the ground. He couldn't count all of them, but he took a few pieces of cloth, counted and estimated how many there are. So this kind of selective fogging of insects of a single species. In fact, it turns out that he chose 19 individual trees of a particular species of, of uh, angiosperm and collected all the insects that are found on that tree. And what he found was quite remarkable. And from this, he developed what we call the host specificity argument. The argument is that many species are specifically dependent on a particular host. Now, if we find out how many species are dependent on one host, and we find out how many hosts there are, then you multiply these two numbers and you get a rough estimate of how many species there ought to be. How many species are specific to one host? How many hosts are there? Therefore, so many species. Now, very briefly, Terry Erwin found 1,200 species of beetles alone on this species of angiosperm. So from the 19 trees put together, he of course classified them as herbivores, predators, fungivores, scavengers. And he tried to estimate, not all of these are host specific. Not all of these are restricted to one species. He tried to find out what proportion of these are host specific. This of course is a very, very crude estimate based on sort of common sense. This is not a, uh, an accurate thing, but that's the best he had. He said at least 20% of herbivore, herbivorous beetles are most likely specific to a single host species and so on. And from this, he came up with a number of 162 host specific species of beetles for one tree. And from this, he made very simple calculations. Now, when you don't have the data, making very simple, what they call, back of the palm calculation should not be looked down upon. That is how science begins. You begin by doing that and then you refine that. So he made some very approximate calculation. He said beetles are 40% of total arthropods. 
So the total canopy arthropods must be 400. If 162 is 40%, then it may be 400. Canopy is twice as rich as the forest floor, so the total number of beetles must be 600. There are 50,000 tree species probably, so the total must be 30 million species of just beetles alone. Now you can see this is as crude as approximate you can get, but this is not hand waving. This is back of the envelope approximate calculation. Now Robert May has looked at this carefully and he has refined this. He has looked at many of the parameters in this, so now we can ask, is it really 40% or is it different? Is it really twice as rich as the, or is it different? Are there 50,000 tree species or is that different? Basically, now you have an equation and you have various parameters in the equation and you can tweak those parameters and then you can keep tweaking this 30 meter. So he produced a method and Robert May was gracious enough to say, pay tribute to his method, although he downward revised this number from 30 million probably to 50 million or probably 6.8 million for all species put together. And I want to quote Robert May here. My reservations do not, however, detract from my admiration of his work, which has advanced us to the point where we can begin systematic investigation of each of the links in his chain of argument. Think of it. There's an argument, there are links in the chain, and we can keep refining the links, but the argument is correct in comparison to earlier estimate, before 1980s, everybody said how many species? Something between three and five million. And that was hand waving. That was not back of the envelope calculation. That's why he says, in comparison to the earlier estimate of 3.5 million, which is pure hand waving. And this is what I like about scientists. He changed, he, he actually showed that they had grossly overestimated, but he did not fault him. He, Gave him credit where it was due because he said he gave us a parallel. So this is one method people are trying to find out. And you can see how we can keep refining them. This is our beetles. Why not for uh, something else? So you can keep doing this. You can keep refining the argument. Now there is a scientific method which we can use to try and approach the truth in terms of how many species there are. Robert May championed, not necessarily invented, but championed another method which is all very interesting. This is what... Um, uh, Arvind would like. This is trying to find out from first principles. And his argument is very simple. He said, if you plot, now this is a log log plot, if you plot the log of the size of organisms on the x-axis and log of the number of species of that kind of organism on the y-axis, then you get a pretty linear negative slope, which means the smaller the organisms get, the more diverse they are. Large organisms are fewer in number of species and the smaller they become. In fact, if, the, if you look at organisms which are about one centimeter in body size and you have a certain number, you look at one centimeter and there are a hundred fold increase in the number of species when you go down from one centimeter to one millimeter. And so Robert May said, if we keep extrapolating this and if we approximately say that the smallest uh, organism which we are interested in, we are not talking about microbes here, is about half a millimeter, then you actually come up, get clear evidence that must be certainly more than 10 million species. So he says this is actually an independent confirmation of the ballpark estimate that Erwin got. So 3.5 million must be absolutely wrong and it must be in the order of 10 or more millions or of that, of that order. So this is an idea of how from first principle you try to estimate. I want to give a flavor of third method, which I actually like very much because it's very cute. It's cute and it is so simple, just based on common sense. So the idea is simply as follows. If you simply go to the literature and plot here, the number of species that people of, let's say birds that people have been describing over time. So on the X axis here, you have years. How many species are every year? How many new species are people recording? And of course the, First, it increases rapidly, and then it sort of begins to plateau. Why is it? Because people are not finding any more new species. It's not that they have suddenly lost interest in birds. If anything, the interest in birds is growing, and the scores of bird watchers are going all the time, and they're very proudly tell you if they have found a new species, which is, by the way, a very rare event. But the point is, it is plateauing, which means we are, have already found and described more or less all the birds there are, and there are very few more to be found. You can see the argument, you can make that kind of argument. Now, this argument is very powerful if you look at not birds, but something else like 
insects or crustaceans. And look at this graph, which just goes on increasing, goes on increasing. In fact, for some time it seemed to slow down and suddenly there is a rapid increase in it. That means there are many, many more species of insects or arachnids or crustaceans that remain to be described. We have not yet been described because the more we look, the more we find. And from this kind of an argument also, one can begin to estimate. And I've just given you a flavor of three. There are many more of these. And the idea is that we finally put all of these two together to come up an estimate. So this exercise of estimating the total number of species that are on Earth is an extremely interesting detective work, and it should draw many, many bright minds to science. It's a very, very interesting thing. And I'm so glad that we don't have the answer, because then it will be boring. Then you will find another problem. This is a problem that's going to feed the curiosity of hundreds and thousands of young minds, if only they know that the problem exists. And my goal today is to tell you that such an exciting problem awaits you. Why not? Maybe you will come up with an entirely new method of approaching the same problem. Think of science as detective work. Don't think of it as you know something that you will read and remember. It's detective work. You have to solve a problem that is not known. You are you should be interested in something that your teacher doesn't know, not what your teacher knows. That's the whole science should be like. Now, in this article, Robert May has you know, every sentence in this article is worth reading and remembering. And I do want to spend a few minutes quoting some things from Robert May's article. The ratio of taxonomists, Himendra uh, Bharti will like this, and I'm sure he already knows this, the ratio of taxonomists to species, so we're talking of how many taxonomies, how many species, is an order of magnitude greater for vertebrates than for plants. So vertebrates are blessed with many more taxonomies uh, than plants, uh, plants, and two orders of magnitude greater than for invertebrates. So you are to get a set of species that are so few taxonomies. One in hundred, if you look at the situation for vertebrates. Robert May says, this is no way to run a business. It reflects intellectual fashions and bears no relation to relative importance of taxa, either in the sweep of every story or in the delivery of ecosystem service. So this partiality that we have towards plants and vertebrates and the neglect of insect it has no scientific basis, no utilitarian basis. It is just fashions. And it, so this is, I will continue to say a few, quote a few more passages from Robert May. Yeah. Reorganizing our priorities rapidly, that is, you know, making sure there are enough taxonomies to also look at insects, etc., to learn about the little things that arguably run a lot of the natural world will not be easy. This is what Robert May wants us. Fascination with the furries and featheries goes deep. In the UK, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds has almost 1 million members. The Analogous Society for Plants, the Botanical Society of the British Isles has around 10,000. And there is no corresponding society to express affection for nematodes. Yeah, the, way of, of saying it, and that is the problem. The task of inventorying is sometimes mistaken for stamp collecting by thoughtless colleagues in the physical sciences, Arvind note. But such information is a prerequisite to the proper formulation of evolutionary and ecological questions and essential for rational assignment of priorities in conservation biology. It is interesting to speculate whether the denizens of other inhabited planets, if there are any, share the vagaries of our intellectual history. A fascination with the fate of the universe and the structure of atom, but lagging behind in interest in the living things with which we share our planet. Now, if a biologist had said this, I would understand. But imagine these words coming from physicists. These are words of Robert May. Now I will take the liberty of telling you a little bit of my story. Such questions have long bothered me. In fact, they make you feel restless. Most biodiversity is in the tropics. And I realized that it has been rapidly disappearing. 
a friend of mine, Michael Robinson, who was a director of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama when he visited there, and later on became a very famous director of the Washington of the zoo in Washington. He used to always tease me, and he has actually said this in print. He said, what are you guys doing? There is a negative correlation between the global distribution of biologists and biodiversity, where there are more, where there is more biodiversity, there are no biologists, and where there is a lot of biologists, there is no biodiversity. And to, to Michael Robinson, biologists means who are interested in whole living organisms. And this is true, but it is most embarrassing. I was therefore, with all this background, I was itching to do something beyond studying a single species of paper wasp, however interesting. I spent my, most of my career studying the Indian paper wasp of Lydia marginata to try and understand why this species lives in social groups, sometimes and sometimes not, how they manage their problems of cooperation and conflict, absolutely fascinating. I can devote many lifetimes to that. Nevertheless, I was itching to do something beyond that, especially I felt the need to contribute something to the study, if not the conservation. It's too arrogant to say, I will do something and that will help conserve biodiversity. I don't think that's easy enough. But at least to study, much, and I think I want to uh, compare this, much as a basic scientist might feel a moral imperative to contribute to an ongoing war effort or a national calamity. You know, we basic scientists do things, we say, Nobody is interested in this today, but someday this will be very interesting, which is all fine. But at some point, when there is a problem, you feel you should also contribute to that. And that's the kind of thing I do. But I didn't know how to go about it. And as I said in my article, then I struck gold. Krishnapa Chandrasekhara, with an MSc in entomology from the University of Agricultural Sciences, and most importantly, with an inordinate fondness for insects, he decided to join me as my first PhD student. That was the luckiest break for me in, in my career. Chandru, as we affectionately called him, not only had a vast knowledge of insects, but he truly had an inordinate fondness for insects. Thus began a friendship that lasted since that time, 1984, until Chandru tragically succumbed to COVID-19 a few weeks ago. It is with a heavy heart that I recount here the fun I had in collaborating with Chandru. We did work on insect biodiversity and we published a paper in the Journal of Bombay Naturalist Society along with other co authors in 1990. And I want to tell you a little about this. We said, yes, it is, we were all disturbed. Most of the biodiversity in the tropics, it is rapidly disturbing, but there are not people studying it. Why should this be true? There are no, or there were no, and still are no long term studies monitoring insect biodiversity in most tropical places, in most, which are the best places? Rotham State Experimental Station and the Smithsonian Tropical Institute in Panama. Now they have long-term programs of marine biodiversity. Now why do they succeed and why are we not able to do that? It's interesting, look at the reason. These people depend on having a powerful light trap, a powerful lamp which attracts all kinds of insects kills them and keeps them ready for the taxonomist next morning to study them in the middle of the forest. And scientists there tell me very proudly that this lab has not been switched off even for one minute for the past 32 years, that kind of statement they make. Obviously, that is not possible for us. Having uninterrupted power supply in a metropolitan is not possible in India. Forget about the middle of the forest. So we said there has to be a paradigm change. This method will not work. This means we will never have it. So we have to do something. I also was disturbed by this idea of having this powerful light trap because I actually visited these places. I talked to the people. They would get kilograms of insects every morning. They would throw away most of them and say, oh, this is what I'm interested in. I wondered sometimes whether they are helping in conserving insect diversity or they're actually helping in destroying insect diversity. So we had to find a way to solve both these problems. We can't have a powerful light trap in the middle of the forest, certainly not uninterrupted, and we don't want to kill so many insects. <clears throat> so we said, let's do poor man's science. So we went to the market in Yashwantpur near uh, Indian science, and we bought a little battery operated lamp. You can see here, a little battery operated lamp. It's a little two, two tubes there. You put eight batteries, and it runs for about eight hours. That's what we want. 
It's battery operated, so it can work in the middle of the forest. It's not powerful. You don't want it to be very powerful. So we put it up on a stand. We put some aluminum. We put a hat here to prevent rainwater. We put some aluminum baffles where the insects will come and hit the baffle and fall. And we had a little aluminum funnel. And from our kitchen, we stole uh, a little plastic box where you store uh, rice and uh, dal and so on. And this is our light trap. You know, it costs nothing and it can work anywhere. And even the stand and so on is dismantled. So you can dismantle all this, put it in your bag, take it to the middle of the forest, set it up in 15 minutes, and you switch on the light at night. In the morning, you have some insects here. We put a little insecticide. We have very few insects, but that's all we want. We don't want to kill a lot of insects. Now, we realize, of course, that we won't get too many insects. So we said we must supplement this method with other methods, which are also easy to use, where you can put them anywhere. And hopefully, because you have different methods, they might catch different kinds of insects rather than one kind of insect. So we set up what we call a pitfall trap. The same jar, we simply buried it under the ground, put a hat on it, and inside that we put a little insect. Now insects are crawling on the ground, will accidentally fall into this and will get trapped. Now these are not the ones who are likely to be attracted to the light trap. So you can see that these are different kinds of insects and we can actually collect diversity. We set up what we call center trap, the same kitchen jar with a little hat, with a little stand <coughs> and some fermenting jaggery solution inside left with a drum of insecticide. So flying insects will get attracted to the smell, fall, get trapped and we could look at them. Finally, we set up a systematic method of taking insect net and sweeping the vegetation on the ground to collect all insects that we can find in designated 10 meter by 10 meter areas. And here is Chandru making a systematic net sweep. So using a combination of these methods, we tried to sample insects in the forest of Western Guards. We went to uh, two places in uh, Uttarakhand district of Karnataka, one at the coastal level and another at about 600 meter elevation. And here we set up plots. So we had good forests, plots in good forests, in minor forests, in plantations, in leaf manure forests. We had some of them in the coastal site, some of them in the elevation site. And so we sampled all of these. So we set up our package of method. And in each of these sites, we had three replicate one hectare plot. In each one hectare plot, we put our light trap in the middle and we randomly chose. So we divide this into 10 by 10. We had 100 quadrats here and we randomly chose and said, okay, one pitfall trap will go here, another pitfall trap will come here and simulate one center trap here and we do net sweeps here. So this way we sampled this in as systematic, objective, reproducible fashion as possible. And we did this for three such <laughs> The train which goes by near my window, it is usually very charming, but when I give a lecture, it may interrupt you, uh, interrupt your hearing. So we repeated this three times in three one hectare plots, each of the 12 sites. So we had 36 such plots. And we could then tabulate what did we find? What is the, the site, the plot number, the number of orders of insects, number of families of insects, number of species, number of individuals, and the alpha diversity. Now we did not identify the species that was not possible. We simply looked up to the family and we said, this species is different from that. We don't know what its name is. This is sometimes called a recognizable taxonomic unit. That's how we classified this and we came up with this. Let's just look at the last row. We managed to sample 19 orders of insects, 219 families, 1,079 1, species and 16,852 individuals. So in this entire effort, we collected only 16,852 individuals. This is orders of magnitude less than what is collected in one night in one light trap. But it's not the quantity that matters. It's the diversity that you want. You want to know the distribution. There's no point in getting 1 million individuals of a particular kind of beetle. No point in killing them. So this, is, this was our aim. And now from this, we could analyze again. I won't go into the details very briefly. We, this is the summary as I already showed you, uh, 16,852 individuals. Now, what did we catch? We could say we, in light trap, what did we get? In net sweep, what did we get? In pitfall trap, in, and again, we did get very different kinds of insects in each of these traps. So it justified our approach to combine many different methods rather than rely on one method. We can also plot, for example, which kind of insect. 
polyoptera, orthoptera, hemiptera, lepidoptera, what did we get in different kinds of traps? And again, you can see that the combination of these traps allowed us to get different things. Now, I want to remind you, none of this research cost any money. We didn't apply for any grant. We didn't get anything. We traveled in a bus from Bangalore to either Sirsi or Kumta, where it is, by overnight bus, and we had our little kitchen plastic boxes. We set them up. We didn't need any money. We often think that, you know, you can't do research unless you have a big research grant, you have a sophisticated laboratory, and you have the costly instrument. That's not really necessary. With just this, we were able to do all of that. Continuing with the summary, we were able to compare diversity in different localities. So, for example, we were able to say that the insect diversity in Bizaraldi is significantly different from Santagal and so on. So, we were able to statistically, because we had these quantitative numbers, statistically we can say which plot is more diverse than which plot. And then we can begin to ask why. So you can also compare, for example, light trap and net sweeps got us somewhat similar insects, but scented traps got a very different kind of insect. So we can compare. This comparison across two things is called beta diversity. The diversity in a place is called alpha diversity. The diversity of insects in a place is alpha diversity. The comparison of diversity between place A and place B, that is called beta diversity. So we can also calculate beta diversity. Similarly here for all the different traps. And you can see that each method, the replicates gave us similar diversity. But between methods, it was different. And that's what makes it, makes it very interesting. Also gives us confidence in our method. You can see here again, the same thing. The three light traps nest together in this tree. Net sweeps, pitfall traps, center traps. Clear indication that these different methods give you different kinds of insects. So the variation from light trap 7 to light trap 8 is less than the variation from light trap 7 to net sweep 7. And that gives you an indicator. So there's lots of interesting things you can do with just a little bit of data. As I said, no money, no great equipment, just a lot of fun traveling to these places, working in these forests, living in these remote places, and then lots of data to play with, simple statistics. You can compare for all of the different sites, and you can compare the different plantations. As I said, I won't go into the details. The paper is there if anybody would like to read it. Then we did something else which I found very interesting. I'm very fond of what we affectionately call quick and dirty methods. Don't wait for a big instrument. I, I was interested in knowing whether the diversity of insects on the forest floor is influenced by how much sunlight penetrates through the canopy. Common sense suggests it must. But how do we measure this? So we didn't apply for a grant and said, I want this fancy instrument to measure how much light. We said, let us have a quick and dirty method. All we are interested in is crude estimates of variation one plot to the other. So we looked at the canopy. In some cases, it's very thick. The canopies of many different trees overlap. So if you look straight up, you will find the canopy of several trees, one on top of the other. You can make out because the trees are different. Go to other places, there are fewer, still fewer, still fewer, even fewer. This must make a difference. So we said, let us estimate how many layers of canopy do we have above our head? And this is very uh, So we chose 50 places in this one hectare plot. We stood up and we counted two layers, three layers, one layer, zero layer. And we constructed a very simple canopy cover index, which is simply the number of trees whose canopies intersected the line of sight above the observer's head at 50 randomly chosen points. We averaged over it and we got an index of canopy cover. We call this canopy cover index. And now we could plot canopy cover index in the x-axis and various parameters in the y-axis. And for the species and for the diversity, we didn't get a significant effect. But for the number of individuals, there was a clear negative effect. So the more the canopy cover index, the fewer number of individuals. So if there is more sunlight, you actually get more insects. If there's less sunlight, you have fewer insects. So one can then begin to understand how this works and why this works. So this is how you begin. And you could also, of course, classify uh, different orders of insects, how we got them in different places. And between the, we showed that between replicates, how it works and so on. So it's a very uh, nice method. So thus, we developed and field tested a package of methods, because these are different methods, and how to apply them. They can be deployed in the remotest places with the barest of facilities and infrastructure to make reliable estimates of tropical insect diversity. I'm happy to say that the, our methods have received some attention and are actually being adopted by a few tropical ecologists. 
But the real question one one can should not pat one back uh, one, one's back and say, "Oh, wonderful." Is that enough? The answer is no. Clear no. No in capital letters. Recently, fortunately, there has been increased realization amongst the common public about the dire state that insect diversity is. I strongly recommend to you a few simple articles. This one is published in Science Magazine. It's called, Where Have All the Insects Gone? Many of you may already know that some sensational reports of insects being missing, insects being lost, have been reported from Germany. People have found there are very few insects. So here is some data, it looks like this. So if you plot here at different times, simply crudest estimate, how many grams of insects are collected in light traps? You can see that between 1989 and 19, uh, 2013, there's a steep decline, decline in month of May, in the month of June, in the month of July, month of August, month of September, month of October. Every month of the year, between 1989 and 2013, if you compare simply the total grams of insects collected on the floor, there's a huge decline. The decline is about 78% decline in the number of insects. Where are all the insects? The insect apocalypse is here. This is from the New York Times magazine. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? The, another article, recent, most, more recently by Elizabeth Penisi in Science, talks about how insects get attracted to lights. Fatal attraction to light at night pummels insects. Fearing artificial lights add to insect apocalypse, researchers seek solutions. So look at this picture and remember what we said in the 1980s. Let us not use one powerful light trap and collect kilograms of insects. This is, this is accidental. That was deliberate. And you can see people are documented. Just look at the cloud of insects that are being attracted to light and are being destroyed unnecessarily. The Entomological Society of America arranged a symposium uh, in 2019 called Insect Decline in the Anthropocene. And the proceedings of the symposium with some additional articles have been published in a special issue of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's called Insect Decline in the Anthropocene, Death by a Thousand Cuts. I will give you some summary of this paper, of the papers. In, in fact, there's an introductory paper which tells you what's coming in the issue and I'll quote a few things from that. A 2020 United Nations report estimated that more than a million species are in danger of extinction over the next few decades. This is for all organisms put together. More than a million species are in danger of extinction. How many have we recorded? 1.5 million. Don't forget that. We have recorded 1.5 million and 1 million, not of those, but of the total, 1 million are right. So look at the scale at which the destruction happens. It's not a small fraction somewhere, but a significant, even if you take 6.8 million as a total number, losing 1 million of 6.8 million, that's disastrous. That is worse than apocalypse that you can think of. Terrestrial, now, these details are very interesting. Remember the ratio of taxonomies, vertebrates, the luckiest having most taxonomies per species, plants were not doing so well, and insects were in this sort of situation. This is reflected here. Terrestrial vertebrate population sizes and ranges have contracted one third. How is it reflected? We can say things with certainty. Many mammals have experienced range declines of at least 80% over the last century. Half of amphibians are imperiled. Bird numbers across North America have fallen by 2.9 billion. Prospects of the world's coral reef beyond the middle of the century can scarcely be more dire. Now, there's a very interesting contrast. Next slide is about insects. What is interesting is that although all of this is terrible, all of these groups are in better shape because we can estimate, we can get the knowledge. The trouble with insects, we don't know. That nothing can be worse than that. What about insects? Although a flurry of reports has drawn attention to declines in insect abundance, biomass and species richness, and range sizes, 
whether the rates of decline for insects are on par with or exceed those other groups remains unknown. There are still too little data to know how the steep insect decline reported for Western Europe, mainly Germany and California Central Valley, areas of high human density and activity compared to population trends in sparsely populated regions and wildlands. Long-term species level demographic data are meager from the tropics, almost non-existent, where considerably more than half of the world's insect species occur. This is the tragedy. With insects, the tragedy is not just that they're declining, but we don't even know how much they are declining and where they are declining. Forget about why they are declining. And that is why the need of the hour is an inordinate form of insects. I want to spend the last few minutes, uh, if you permit me, to again go in a slightly more personal note. I want to come back to my student Chandru. This was actually a side project. This was not his thesis. His thesis was in fact on the Indian paper was Rapalaria marginata, whose picture you see here next to Chandru's picture. He wrote a very fine thesis on this wasp. It's called Social Biology of the Tropical Primitively to Social Wasp Rapalaria marginata. Of the submitted to Indian Science in 1991. And together, along with others, he, he co authored 20 scientific papers with me. I am listing 12 of the most important ones here. And again, I put this here not because I'm going to read it, not because you're going to read it this minute, but I'm hoping that this the video of this uh, talk will be available and then you can actually find these papers. These are the 12 most important papers that Chandru and I co authored. After finishing his PhD, with me in 1991, he went back to the University of Agriculture Sciences, which was his alma mater, which was his favorite place, and spent the rest of his life until a few weeks ago, just transmitting his inordinate fondness for insects to students in lectures, to students in research lab, and to the wide public. I want to show this picture, which was supplied to me by a mutual friend, El Shamal, where Chandru here is actually explaining about insects to eager young kids. And I want to see all of them become interested in this. I want all of them to be enamored by the fact that we don't know the answer. We have to change our education system and instill in our students curiosity about the unknown. What we are doing is we are telling you don't know, you read that book, you read this book, there's so much to know, I'm going to give you an exam. Please mug up everything that is known. Forget what is known. Find out what is unknown. And then read the known in order to find a pathway to get to the unknown. The focus should be on unknown. That is where it will spark the interest of young people. You tell these people, I have not written 20 papers, read all of them. They say, go to hell. Why should I even bother? But tell them, here is a problem. Here is a puzzle. Here is a riddle. I don't know the answer. Maybe you can find out. That will spark the interest of young people. That is how we must teach. Again, on a personal note, I want to show one image, very personal. This is the last time I actually met Chandru personally when he came for a dinner, wedding reception uh, for my son and daughter-in-law. This is Chandru and this is Yamini, his wife, and these are my, some family members, some lab mates and so on. This is the last time we actually saw him. This was in early uh, uh, last year, early 2020. I have seen him since then. But insects will keep reminding me of Chandru, whether through their beauty or through their distress. In both cases, they will remind me of Chandru. We must benefit from his tireless efforts at spreading his inordinate fondness for insects through education and outreach. We can pay him no greater tribute. Thank you. Uh. Thank you, Professor Gardker, for your talk. And uh, I have got uh, some questions from students. Uh, they have been quite uh, inquisitive about uh, what you have been discussing. Uh, I'll start with uh, some questions. Uh, uh, first of all, two questions are interrelated. Uh, one is by Gurkirat from first year and other is by Harsimran from second year. Uh, Gurkirat wants to ask, uh, which species of insects 
do we think is the most advanced species, as we say, uh, human is the most advanced species among vertebrates, wrongly or rightly. And the other question seems to be even more difficult to answer by Harsimran, that which insect or which group of insects should be considered the most primitive, uh, both uh, related to each other, both these questions. Very, yes, very, very Human species the most advanced? Really? What about <laughs> coronavirus? Who is more advanced? <laughs> you have so, the, the, the most advanced Evolution doesn't work like that. Evolution doesn't give mark. In fact, some time ago, it would have been maybe not so easy for you to convince that human species not the most advanced. But today, we have the battle going on between what is probably the most primitive, namely a virus, and the most advanced, namely Homo sapiens, and you can see who is doing There is no such thing as most advanced, most primitive. What happens is that different species need different conditions to fight. We call this an ecological system. And there are many, many niches. What evolution does, it makes you adapted to your niche. You are not adapted to the globe. You are adapted to your, your niche, means where you live, the soil, the temperature, the chemistry there, and the, your neighbors and your predators and your prey, all of that. Matter. So, survival of the fittest means you simply survive best to have a large number of offspring in the next day. Nobody is globally most advanced. You can't even define that. So, if you, if you think of one on one competition, then clearly coronavirus is more advanced than you should be. So, this concept of most advanced is very However, if you look at the differentiation of a species, let's say there is one species A, and in evolution, it split into two species, B and C, A is the ancestor, B and C. We can find out when this split occurs. I use phylogeny, I look at the fossils, I look at the molecular data, by constructing molecular tree, we can plot on the x-axis time in millions of years, on the y-axis when the split actually happens. So when the time when A is split into B and C, you can say this is the birth of B. Now a little bit later, B will split into B and E. That is the date of birth of B and E. So you can say D was born later than B. That you can say. Doesn't make it more primitive or more advanced or better to survive. There is no such linear scale of primitive or successful. I don't think you will be successful. It's hard to imagine there's no success to be It doesn't know that by destroying everything else, you will improve yourself. So we have to understand the meaning of uh, We have uh, another question by Ruksana and. Uh, a similar question by Jovan Veer. Uh, they are saying that uh, we know that a lot of species are yet to be discovered and we are laying stress on uh, knowing what exists and knowing what type of biodiversity do we have. Uh, isn't it interfering in their survival rather for those species at least which are endemic to a particular area and which exist only in small numbers are not we uh, destroying their uh, diversity rather than helping them out? Yes. So we have a certain amount of biodiversity. We want to be knowledge about it. And we are motivated by two reasons for wanting to help. One is that we want to benefit from them. See, this is a very justified thing. I mean, you want to know about it. If you are not interested in justifying, you won't have all this food. Okay? So we are certainly interested in exploiting these for our use. But we also want to know about them so that we can conserve them if they are going to be. So let's take a purely practical. Let us say our only interest is our benefit. But if we don't save them, if they disappear, we don't get any bit more. So we must do all we can to try and conserve them. Now, in order to conserve them, we have to study them. In order to study them, you may have to destroy a few. Now, instead of taking a blanket saying, I will not kill any insect, this won't work. You have to choose what is the cost and what is the benefit. What is the cost of killing a few individuals for the survival of species? 
what is the benefit of killing a few individuals for the survival? By killing a small number of individuals, if you can understand something, which you can actually help to conserve that species, then that little killing is actually beneficial. So you have to make that kind of thing. And you can see, right, in the of my lecture I said, I did not like the idea of putting these big light traps in the middle of the forest and catching kilograms of insects. I don't agree with that. But to catch a few insects, they're actually, so you have to think of cost benefit ratio. What is the cost to you as well as to the insect? So you have to work in that ratio of cost and benefit where the benefit is greater than that. So you may come to an extreme situation where the cost is so great no matter what the benefit, it is not permissible. If the last individual of a species is left, don't kill it. Because by under killing it and understanding, what will you conserve? There is nothing left. So you can have that extreme. You can also work at the other extreme, where killing a few thousand still will help the remaining billions. So there is no straightforward answer to this question. And it's important for young people to realize everything will complicated. You can't say which is the most advanced, which is the most primitive. You can't say whether we should kill insects, we should not kill insects. So we must understand it and direct our actions. Uh, another question by Herman, which is should I think should be more close to your heart. She's asking uh, which concept in evolution of social insects is more proper, kin selection or group selection? This is a an ongoing debate. There are different kinds of answers. There are there is something called kin selection, which basically says an act of altruism is favored by natural selection because it is directed to those relatives who share your genes, and therefore it's not really an act of altruism. It's actually an act of selfishness because you're helping your own genes by helping another individual who is carrying. This is one argument. Group selection argument says, irrespective of whether you are related. To not. If you help your group and your group survives in competition with other groups, then you are actually being benefited. Now, you can again see it depends on situation. If you are living in an environment where there are groups, then groups fight with each other. If conflict, inter group conflict is more important than intra group conflict, then my survival does not depend on my winning a battle with my neighbor, but winning a battle with neighboring units. If that is the kind of situation, you can see that the conditions are favorable for group selection. Whereas if you are living in a more uniform environment, where there are no groups like this, but there are relatives and non relatives then so again depends on the kind of situation. I think the one thing that people all over the world, the best of scientists, have not paid enough attention is that evolution depends on ecology. And we may build models without worrying about the ecology. The validity of any evolution idea will depend on and in which ecological setting you think that theory will work. So neglect of ecology has been very severe in and therefore ecology is very important. Ecology is very important. Uh, another question from Palak. Uh, MSc second year environmental sciences. She's asking about uh, the importance of pollinating uh, soap bubble pollinating technique, uh, whether it is beneficial for insects or uh, uh, it is beneficial for us, or what is its importance? Is it about a particular technique? She's soap bubble pollinating technique. Sorry, I. Uh, I cannot comprehend, but uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with this. <laughs> anyway, the last question by our Sir Sishal, he wants to ask whether uh, the conservation techniques or conservation policies that we are following in India, are they sufficient to save insect biodiversity? Are there policies we are following? <laughs> I'm not sure we are following enough policies. We need a lot. See, remember, it's very easy to blame people like say, you know, they want to destroy the world, politicians are not interested. It's very easy to say all this. But ask yourself the question. If you are given all the freedom, if you are there, 
in a quarantine company i'll tell you what to tell you what to do you know what to say we need a great deal more knowledge like a dream that we can do better than they are doing now with the existing knowledge but we need a lot more knowledge even the existing knowledge is not at all adequate for us to have a conservation policy so we need of course to implement what we know what's more important is we need to learn a great deal more so that we can come up with in many cases we do not know what will happen if you cut trees we do not know what will happen if you allow some forest fires to go on we do not know what will happen if you destroy one species of insect we do not know what will happen so great deal of that's nice you know think of it like why are we not able to get rid of plants people always say oh, you know, we are so advanced we spend so much money why are why is cancer the problem politicians always like to ask this question it's a damn difficult problem we don't know 90% of what we need to do is not simple. We need to do the problem, and we keep working on it. It's not so easy. It's not that I am not willing to cure to, uh, cancer. Similarly, biodiversity conservation. If you don't get to know how many species we already know, so starting from there, these are the problems. A problem, and we need a great deal more knowledge in order even to be able to come up with conservation policies which will be adequate. And while that is happening, you are also that is the problem. I think that's all from this side. Uh, uh, now I request Dr. Bharti to thank the honourable speaker for his uh, talk and for this uh, uh, wonderful interaction, sort of uh, uh, digital interaction with the students. Uh, over to Dr. Bharti. Um, thank you, Dr. Devendra, and uh, may I ask Professor Arvind, Honourable Vice Chancellor, if he wishes to say something. No, you are not audible. I made the initial remarks and now I thank uh, Raghavendra for a beautiful, wonderful lecture. I did not know that Chandru passed away. So it's a very, I'm very sorry to hear that. COVID, I don't know how many, how, we started with the Bauguna, ended with Chandru. So COVID time is a really a difficult time. I wish everyone good health and uh, a very nice talk and I hope we will take the academic lecture series forward in a big way. So thank you, everyone. So thank you, Professor Gadkar. It was nice and quite stimulating, passionate talk as usual from you. And hopefully we will have you here also. Thank yes. you so much. I look forward to that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.